Thank you very much, Murat. Uh, so I will uh, now share my presentation to everybody. Uh, and yeah, this is, um, yeah, this is uh, uh, that as always, as also in, other, in, in previous, uh, in previous um, conferences, which I have attended here. It's always a pleasure to be here and to speak uh, about what, what's happening in, uh, uh, in the European steel market uh, and uh, for seed using sectors in Europe. Uh, and as always, I will get started with uh, uh, an overview of the, of the macroeconomic picture, which is obviously very important for uh, the European steel sector and for uh, steel using industries. Uh, the title of my presentation was The Steel Market Amidst, amidst Growing Challenges. And growing challenges are, um, let's say, um, ahead of us and are um, casting a shadow of uncertainty on the overall economic outlook. So we, we present here the latest uh, macroeconomic uh, um, forecast, uh, GDP growth forecast for 2021. Uh, the, the latest one was released yesterday by the OECD. Uh, and, in an, and also we, uh, we present the latest quarter on quarter figures for Q3 2021. Uh, obviously 2020 figures uh, reflect very much the, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit um, advanced economies and not, not only advanced economies, the global economy uh, with unprecedented uh, economic recession, for example, in the EU by uh, almost 6%. Uh, relatively lower in the US, minus 3.4%, and also the recession has impacted uh, differently uh, individual uh, European member states. But in any case, it is, it's been for the EU the worst economic recession ever. Uh, and since, uh, since the, um, the recession of 2020, in 2021, we've seen, as we will see, four seed in the sector, very, very sharp, even faster than expected rebound in activity. Uh, which has resulted in uh, um, positive GDP growth rates uh, in, uh, in, in Q, Q4 2020 and also in Q1 2021, but particularly in Q2 2021, we had a very exceptional rebound in GDP, followed by another positive quarterly figure in Q3, as you can see here, uh, growth by 2.6% uh, in Italy, by relatively lower 1.8% in Germany, 3% in France, and 2.1% and for the, the overall EU. But however, uh, these figures did not, that's my core message, did not yet reflect the impact of the ongoing uh, issues that are casting a shadow of uncertainty on the overall economic outlook. And particularly, uh, we've seen in, in, in recent weeks uh, um, some downside factors, namely uh, skyrocketing energy prices, particularly natural gas prices, and to a lower extent, uh, carbon price, uh, coal prices, um, really, really high energy prices, which uh, are hampering uh, profitability of the of the industrial sector. Uh, inflation has been accelerating all over the economic, uh, all over the um, the European Union, particularly in in, in Germany, with um, record highs over the last four years in Germany, in almost six percent. But most importantly, ongoing very serious global supply chain issues with uh, um, skyrocketing shipping costs, a shortage of components, uh, bottlenecks all along the supply chain. And this is really hampering growth and, 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 and uh, increasing uncertainty for the economy and uh, uh, making uh, investment decision uh, more difficult. Um, so the economic landscape is changing very quickly as a result of these uh, downside factors, energy prices, inflation, and supply chain issues. So we believe that the next, very next uh, uh, growth forecast will uh, um, reveal a, a more subdued, a weaker growth outlook. Uh, uh, for That's to say for 2022. 2022 is likely to be impacted at least until full first quarter of 2022 is going to be impacted by um, ongoing supply chain issues and and uh, and uh, all other um, downside factors which I've just mentioned, say energy prices and uh, accelerating inflation. So the economic landscape appears to be very much influenced by this um, um, more certainty uh, landscape, which is ahead of us. Um, as, as a result, uh, for 2021, as UFA um, forecast, we foresee for the EU a growth of 4.7%, which is slightly lower 
than the latest European Commission forecast released in November, which is 5%. And the US overall will continue to grow at a higher rate than the EU and also the euro area with a growth of uh, slightly below 6%, even though it has been lowered by the OECD in its, uh, in its most recent uh, forecast. So that's the economic outlook in a nutshell. So we, we have a, um, here a, um, a very quick overview of confidence indicators and the evolution of uh, economic uh, uh, overall economic confidence on the left-hand side and industry confidence on the right-hand side, just to show that the two um, the developments in the two indicators are very much correlated. There's a tight correlation between the two. So it means what it means that um, after Q2 2020, which was the harshest moment of the recession due to the pandemic last year, uh, the uh, recovery of the economy has been largely industry driven. I would say primarily industry driven, where services have remained to be weak due to ongoing restrictions to the traveling and hotel and restaurant services. So industry has provided a, an incredible uh, um, contribution to, to economic growth. But however, as you can see here in the, in, in the, very, last, in the very last months, since August, September this year, um, confidence in the economy and the industry after a very, very sharp rebound, an exceptional rebound in the previous months has started to ease, which may pave the way for um, much flatter, uh, if not very weak developments on the months ahead due to the ongoing supply chain disruption, which I've mentioned. So in the next slide, we, we, we see developments in steel using centers, which are um, primarily the, the demand side for, for, for the steel sector in Europe. So this is really where demand, where steel demand comes from. And here we have selected the four major steel using sectors, which are construction, automotive, mechanical engineering, and domestic appliances. And also we have, uh, we present a total sweep that is the steel weighted industrial production. And here we see the evolution uh, since Q1 2017 in, in every quarter, we see the evolution of uh, growth rates on an annual basis. Uh, and you see clear the pattern, which is uh, a, a continued easing and then downturn in uh, uh, steel and sectors growth uh, well before the pandemic, which started in, uh, in second half of 2018. This started in, in, in the EU, this slowdown in manufacturing sector, in stingy sectors, started primarily because uh, that was a reflection of the trade tensions which were uh, triggered by some unilateral um, U.S. administration decisions, um, primarily U.S. Section 232, but trade tensions at a global level increased considerably. And also, um, the industrial cycle had been very pronounced, very strong uh, in 2016 and 2017. So in 2018, we had this slowdown, which then um, turned to a real uh, downturn to uh, uh, negative growth rates in steel using sectors output in, in uh, throughout the 2018, and then obviously culminated in the in the trough of the cycle in, in very very pronounced in in, in plummet it pronounced the drops in output and plummeting growth rates uh, down to even minus uh, 50 percent for the automotive sector, which has been the most exposed sector to this uh, uh, to this uh, downturn also because it's uh, it's the most uh, ori export oriented sector across uh, uh, across industrial sectors in Europe so the automotive sector was was hit the most by the pandemic and then since uh, the the uh, the industries were able to restart and to reopen after being shut down de facto by governments for almost two months, which explains the dramatic drop in Q2 2020. Then since the restart of the industry, we've seen a very, very sharp rebound, even faster than expected, with all these steel sectors already back to growth into positive territory already in Q4 2020 and, 20, and Q1 2021. Uh, we then uh, in Q2 2021, which is the latest quarterly figure available, um, very pronounced growth rates up to 40% for some student sectors and even uh, above 60% for automotive, but bearing in mind that automotive had been plummeting in Q2, in Q2 2020 by almost, uh, almost 60%. So this exceptional, really one-off rebound pretty much reflects the comparison with the um, record lows seen in Q2 2020. But then, um, uh, apart from these exceptional growth rates, we've seen clearly an upward trend 
in studios and sectors, activity reflecting um, much better conditions of industry and uh, a strong economic uh, industry conditions across Europe, uh, which is likely to continue a bit at very more, at much, much more moderate rates also in Q3 2021, uh, which we will have uh, shortly available, uh, but we will, uh, we will most probably see uh, almost flat rates and very, very low growth rates in Q4 2020, which has already been impacted uh, considerably by the ongoing supply chain uh, disruptions. So in the next slide, we see a couple of uh, key leading indicators which actually anticipate uh, actual output uh, uh, developments in, in, in CDC sectors and in the industry in, in, in general, in the manufacturing sector, uh, sector in general. So in, on the left-hand side, we have the evolution of orders for uh, major studios and sectors, here we use the uh, Eurostat classification, but the breakdown remains more or less the same. We have construction, mechanical engineer, motor vehicles, which is automotive, and then metal goods, which is uh, which all show clearly uh, a clear uh, downward trend since the uh, second half of 20, uh, 2018, as we've seen for actual output in studios and sectors, then it becomes clearly uh, a dramatic, a, a dramatic drop uh, plummeting orders in Q2 2020 uh, since um, as a result of the outbreak of a pandemic. And then we have this uh, very, very strong rebound, again, very, very sharp rebound with orders all in positive territory uh, already in, in, early 20, in, in early 2021. Uh, particularly uh, motor vehicles and, and automotive has experienced a very, very sharp, uh, faster, uh, very, very sharp rebound. And also mechanical engineering construction has been uh, more stable, uh, on the contrary, and has shown uh, relatively more resilient developments even before the pandemic and then after the pandemic with a lower fall in orders compared to the other sectors and then go back to, then has gone back to uh, positive order levels um, in the second half of, of 2021. Well, but at much lower levels than, uh, much lower levels than uh, the other stages and sectors. But then here again, we see Starting from July, August this year, we have a clear um, sl uh, slowdown and e easing activity in uh, expectations, uh, which lead to um, lower le lower order levels and easing orders in in, in studios and sectors, which uh, clearly reflect uh, a, a much much uh, a more asserting out industrial outlook and lower expectations for the rest of 2021. Uh, and um, on the on the right side, we see the quarterly evolution of industrial production for the whole manufacturing sector. We see the same pattern. We see here um, declining um, growth rates year on year for the EU and the major EUI industrial economies with um, this downturn becoming even more serious in Q1 2020 before the pandemic then Obviously, um, we, we, in Q2, due to the, the, the industry shutdown and, and the restrictive measures due to COVID, then we have plummeting, um, plummeting growth rates down to um, extremely negative levels, minus 30% in Italy and Spain. And then we have these rebounds quarter on quarter in Q3 and Q4, but still resulting in negative growth rates. And then finally, in industrial production back to positive territory in Q1 2021. And here we have this uh, exceptional one-off uh, rebound uh, uh, in, in Q2021 due to the comparison with the um, extremely low industrial production volumes uh, in Q2 2020. Then back to uh, positive growth rates, which continue in, uh, in Q3 2021. Uh, which we also expect to see for CDUs and sectors output uh, when we'll have the data available then, uh, but obviously at much, much more, low, at much, much lower um, growth rates uh, back to normal levels after the exceptional rebound in Q2. Uh, but then we expect again in Q4 to see very, very low, if not uh, negative growth rates in industrial production due to the um, ongoing supply chain issues. Then we have a, a very um, brief, uh, over, more detailed overview on the two uh, most important uh, studios and sectors for the um, for the European uh, uh, steel um, sector. The first is construction, which accounts actually for roughly 35% of the plant steel consumption in Europe. Construction has been, as I said, 
uh, relatively more resilient, uh, um, also because the construction cycle is, to a certain extent, a bit disconnected from the general industrial and economic cycle, and reacts most, more slowly to the changes in the economic cycle and to external shocks. Construction output dropped by almost 5% in 2020, will rebound by 6.4% in 2021, will, uh, according to our latest forecast, uh, will also grow by 4.2% in 2022. Here we see the evolution of confidence indicator in the construction sector, which pretty much reflects the same development seen in the uh, economic confidence indicator and the industrial confidence indicator. The sector, in our view, appears to be a relatively, uh, let's say, better placed than other uh, stages of sectors in terms of seizing the opportunity of the recovery because um, it will primarily benefit uh, from considerable public support, uh, both for civil engineering, that is via the infrastructure spending, uh, which will be uh, supported by the next generation EU package, and also in relation to the um, private residential subsector. Uh, there are many housing support schemes that are in place in many member states which are supporting housing demand. So the construction sector appears to be um, relatively uh, well placed um, for the next, uh, for, for the rest of the uh, outlook for 2022. Whereas the picture appears to be completely different from the automotive sector, uh, we see here uh, on, the, on the left hand side, we, we see on, um, on the demand side, the number of passenger car registration in the EU. This uh, table is provided by the European Car Makers Association, the ASEA, which is also based in Brussels. Here, here you see the last, latest monthly evolution, latest uh, monthly figures are clearly negative and show continued year on year falls in uh, uh, passenger car registration. So demand remains very weak despite the a uh, strong rebound in the in the in the um, activity of the, of the of the of the car industry and the rebound in 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 output and in orders. Um, demand from consumers remain very weak, um, particularly because um, there are a certain is linked to the new implementation of electric vehicle standards, which the EU has set to be compulsory by uh, 2035. So the US set this ambitious target to ban completely petrol cars by 2035, and which will be fully replaced by uh, electric vehicles. But the implementations of electric vehicles is a bit lagging behind, and this contributes to creating uncertainty among the uh, producers and consumers. Uh, on, the, on, the on the right hand side, you see the evolution of uh, the automotive sector in quarterly terms, and also our latest uh, forecast uh, for the remaining quarters of 2021 and 2022 and also in, in annual terms we see that the outlook is appears to be um, pretty much influenced by and hampered by the ongoing uh, supply chain issues which are hitting the automotive sector in particular the automotive sector is most um, export oriented and most exposed to fluctuations in trade and shocks in international trade um, so, um, as a result, um, after a, a drop in output by 21%, which was the most severe among stages of sectors, the automotive sector in the EU will see a rebound of uh, 9%, which is lower than our previous outlook, in 2021 and by 12% in 2022. So, to recap, this is an overview of um, the evolution of stages of sectors in annual terms, and we, we have produce this slide to compare what is happening in the, the last recession, which we call the COVID recession in 2020, with uh, what has happened in the, in, the, in the previous big recession that has hit Western economies, that was the financial crisis of 2009. But we have also put here the, the, the effects of the pre-COVID-19 recession, as we call it, which was the recession in the industry and uh, which has uh, being seen already in 2019 before the onset of the pandemic. And what we see here is primarily three things. So three points I want to make here. The first is that a COVID recession in 2020 was milder for the European industry than, the, uh, than in 2009 uh, during the financial crisis. Um, the second thing is that the um, CGC sectors were in recession already in, in, in 2019 and some of them even in 2018 
So, for example, automotive was already in recession with a minus almost one minus one percent in in output in 2018, and also domestic appliances were in a recession uh, due to the tensions in manufacturing that I was explaining earlier. And automotive has been hit most severely, both uh, in 2020 and in in, in 2009. So, in both recessions, uh, due to the fact that it is most exposed to to most vulnerable to shocks in international trade and to global supply chain shocks. So, as a result, here total sweep in the EU has dropped by minus 10% in 2020. Will rebound by 8.5% in 2021. Uh, mechanical engineering has dropped by minus 11.2% in 2020, we rebound by almost 11% in 2021. Um, and then we come finally to the steel market, we see what has happened here in the EU as a, uh, as a single uh, steel producing block. Uh, again, as we've seen previously for CGUZ sector, here the time span covers a time range which goes back to the previous big recession that was a recession of 2009. So we see the long-term evolution of steel production. We report here crude steel production in, in, in million tons for all qualities and also the year in year changes. As you can see here, in an actual production in the EU, um, despite uh, very positive years in, in 2017 and, and 2018, then we've had two consecutive recessions in 2019 and in 2020, as, as well as for seed resistance sectors, um, particularly severely um, hit in, in 2020 with a recession of uh, minus 12%. But again, this has not been the most severe uh, recession in steel production experienced in the EU, uh, because the recession experienced in 2009 was bigger, it was a, a drop of 30%. Uh, uh, and um, most importantly, in, in absolute volumes, what you see here is that uh, EU steel production has never recovered the losses experienced uh, due to the recession of 2009. So we, we are still below those levels. And here we see uh, our forecast for 2021, which according to our latest year-to-date figures should result in an increase, a rebound of uh, around 15% compared to 2020, but we, we will remain, however, around levels which are far below what was seen before the uh, recession of 2009. And as a result of the compound average growth rate over the long term, let's say, uh, from 2008 to 2020 was minus 3%. And, uh, and here we see the same pattern, we see the same picture for, um, for the, on the demand side for apparent steel consumption. Um, here we present quarterly data to better show fluctuations, but the pattern remains more or less the same. Uh, I would say pretty much the same. Uh, as you can see here, apparently consumption has never recovered from the losses experienced uh, during the, um, the recession of 2008, 2009, where it fell, it plummeted to record lows. Then we've had this very positive cycle since the industrial recovery of 2013. Uh, which then culminated in, in, in very high volumes uh, around uh, um, Q1, Q2, first half of 2018. But then since Q4, 2018, then apparent consumption has started to decline, reflecting um, weak, much weaker uh, manufacturing conditions um, and uh, trade tensions, as I said, lower steel demand and uh, a process of destocking of reduction in stocks that has been observed um, in, in the EU, which has continued uh, and then has culminated um, to a record, another uh, record low in Q2 2020 after the pandemic. And then since then, we have this very, very sharp rebound in steel demand, which has since then uh, started to grow and uh, um, across all quarters up to Q, Q2 2021, uh, but then has remained um, around rather low levels in historical terms, uh, albeit uh, above um, the levels which were seen in, Q, in Q1 2018. Um, we foresee, um, let's say, a positive evolution of, of, of steel demand already still in Q3 2021, albeit a lower rate and uh, all, with much more uncertainty we foresee for Q4 2020 and up to Q1 2022 due to the ongoing supply chain disruptions, which are very much impacting steel demand from the steel sectors, particularly automotive. And then we have a, 
um, let's say, a more detailed look at the quality evolution of growth rates in apparent consumption since Q1 2019, where we already, we, we already had a, a, a negative developments. We had an, already a downturn uh, in place for apparent consumption. And also we report the evolution of imports, which is very important. Um, both apparent consumption of imports have continued to, to, to drop um, and then have culminated in, in record drops in uh, Q2 2020, obviously as a result of the, of the pandemic and of the shutdown in industries across Europe. Then we've had a rebound since Q3, which however have resulted uh, in, still in, Q, in Q3 has resulted in even near negative growth rates in, in both in apparent consumption and in imports. And then finally in Q4 uh, 2020, uh, apparent consumption in Europe has gone back to growth uh, with an increase of 3.6% year in Europe. Then obviously, we've had, we, which has then been, uh, has continued uh, with uh, an increase of um, around 1% in Q1 2021. And then we've had obviously this exceptional uh, um, rebound, this exceptional growth in Q2 2021, as we've seen for the industrial sector, uh, which is very much likely not to be followed, to be followed by much, much lower growth rates in Q3 and even lower growth rates uh, possibly in Q4. Uh, which appears to be conditioned by the very much uh, by, by uh, extreme uncertainty due to uh, supply chain issue. Uh, in annual terms, uh, apparent consumption dropped by minus 5.2% in 2019, then dropped by minus 10.6% in 2020, and is set to rebound by 13% in 2021, and then grow by 4.7%. A more moderate rate in 2022, provided that we will have, we will not have um, another external shock. That's to say, um, a harsh continuation of a pandemic and a continued supply chain disruption, which are um, experienced to ease substantially in Q1 2022. A real consumption, which is apparent consumption corrected by the stock cycle, is uh, set to follow the same pattern and to drop and to rebound by 7.7% in 2021 after the drop of 10.4% in 2020. The last slide is something about the trade position of the EU uh, in, 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 over the, in recent years. And what we see here is simply is the overall trade balance uh, for Finnish steel products for the EU, uh, which shows that uh, trade balance for the EU has been negative over the last five years. Um, the most severe deficit being recorded in 2018, and then since then, um, there has been uh, some improvement in the sense that this trade deficit has narrowed a bit, but still uh, the EU remains, according to latest annual data available, remains a net importer of Finnish steel products. And then uh, to recap, I want to repeat what I've just already said, uh, but to recap the main the main points that I want to make uh, is that the main challenges for the rest of 2021 and at least first quarter of 2022, with a lot of uncertainty widespread for the rest of 2022, still what we see here is that basically um, downside risk are the, the, the continuation of a pandemic, which is still there in Europe. We see we still have restrictive measures going on. Vaccination plans still below the implementation targets in many member states, which is hampering uncertainty and the economic activity. Uh, global supply chain disruptions are there and are expected to continue at least uh, up to Q1 2022. Inflationary concerns are becoming an issue, uh, really, uh, and uh, inflation has gained ground and reached record highs in, in some European economies, particularly in Germany in August and September. And this could continue, and if so, may even trigger a serious concern in case uh, the European Central Bank wanted to change its monetary policy, which has been exceptionally supportive and accommodative. Uh, inflation has been largely perceived uh, in recent weeks, in recent months, as a temporary phenomenon. But then recently, um, some economists and central, even central bankers have started to say explicitly that this, this might not be a temporary thing and may be there to stay. Uh, but then in any case, uh, uh, Continued acceleration in inflation could uh, trigger a rise in interest rates, which should be 
absolutely avoided, at least in the euro area, as public supporting schemes that has been put in place after the pandemic, such as the next generation EU package, rely considerably on the creation of an enormous amount of public debt, additional public debt. And so a rise in interest rates should pose a serious sustainability problem. But then since so far, the, e the European Central Bank has ruled out any change in its monetary policies and in, in its uh, monetary policy stance. So this is good news, but still uh, inflation is, is a big concern. And then import penetration remains still an issue in the sense that uh, the trade balance remains negative and uh, uh, demand has started to pick up and uh, some uh, major exporters to the EU have increased capacity considerably in recent years. And uh, so this is something which uh, is, a, is a concern for European steel producers, at least. Uh, so this is all. I have, um, I have concluded my presentation. So thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciated your uh, presentation uh, and all the information you have shared with us today. Uh, thank you indeed. Um, so uh, now it's time for the uh, Q&A session. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, remind you that in order to send your questions, please, uh, you need to click on who is attending section at the bottom right hand side uh, of the screen uh, while you are in the virtual conference room, of course. Uh, then click on the exhibitors and the conference room option uh, and then you will be able to type in and send your questions to the conference room. Um, so, um, uh, let me uh, start with my questions, if you don't mind, Alessandro. Um, I have uh, noted that uh, you expect uh, a 15% rebound in steel production in EU uh, next year, right? Uh, what's what actually? What's the uh, capacity utilization rate nowadays? Roundabout uh, in the EU. Mm, mm, I do. I do not. Uh, thank you for your question, Milad. Um Well, actually, I do not have a precise number because we we, we do not collect regularly capacity data uh, because we have uh, some restrictions in terms of. Uh, um, let's say, um, confidentiality rules, you know, in the EU, it's market sensitive data, we have to collect them at company level. But what I can tell you is that um, besides any number, um, currently European steel mills are running almost at their normal capacity, let's say, in line with the historical average. So we, we had some problems, some supply problems, uh, once the industry restarted in Q3 and Q4 last year, we had some short term supply problems because actually steel mills were not immediately able to ramp up production to meet the rebound in, in demand, which was bigger than expected. So, but then this problem has been overcome and we are back to normal production levels. So we, we're back on track, let's say. Okay. So that's 15%. If you, if you, uh, let me go back to that. Uh, there are not a lot of uh, new investments, let me put it that way, as far as I know. Uh, so uh, I would uh, assume then that uh, the capacity utilization rate will be uh, going above the normal rate, right? Yeah, probably. But uh, yeah, probably. But we don't. We do not have um, precise information and quantitative information about that. But but it's 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 clearly it's clearly it's clearly possible. It's clearly possible. Um, there is, what, what I can say is that really there is no supply shortage there in, nowadays in Europe. And it's it really, I mean, European steel mills are running at uh, normal production levels and uh, are able to supply and, uh, and, uh, and work normally. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's really, that, that's the background basically. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, another question is um, about the uh, trade balance. You have shown us that uh, the trade balance was negative for mm -hmm. the last uh, five years. Or mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, foresee the uh, recent uh, agreement uh, between the US and the EU to have an impact on the trade balance, that 3.3 million tons? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, very, very, very good question. I, I heard um, you, you pose more or less of the similar question was raised to, to my previous speaker, 
and I, I, I listened very carefully what he said, and I, I agree to 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 understand what 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 he said, what 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 the answer was, in the sense that it, it's very it's very hard to predict, uh, and in in quantitative terms, uh, what I can say is well, actually the US is one of our largest export destinations for EU exporters. Uh, and uh, we we expect that the recent agreement of Section 232 will pave the way for an increase in exports to to the U.S. But still, as it has been mentioned, the, 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 this new system is based on quota, and it will take time to see how it actually works. Uh, but then, yes, I, I expect I expect some improvement. But more generally, uh, let me say I I expect that this agreement is just the first step towards a, hopefully a full normalization of trade relations between the EU and the US, which have obviously improved since the the, uh, the Biden administration took office. And uh, so this is a first step, but we expect to, let's say, play with the US at, uh, at uh, as we say, at a level playing field, which is, let's say, the same for everybody, and then we can compete fairly. Uh, but yeah, the U.S. are, are really one of, them, of our most important export markets. So for us, it's it's very important that we have reached this uh, this agreement. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly, clearly. Um, another question, maybe. Um, obviously, the safeguard measures in in the European Union have been triggered by the uh, Section Two Three Two uh, mm. implementation by the U.S. Uh, that was kind of a reaction. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that uh, there is some sort of improvement on that side, uh, mm -hmm. would you perhaps expect uh, further improvements on the other side? I mean, the safeguard measures of the EU. As mm, good question. Good question. But, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, in, in, the, in this case, all. Oh, also, it's it's not easy to answer, um, as you, you probably know. Um, a, a review, a comprehensive review of the safeguards is foreseen in uh, around, I think, June 2022. And the European Commission will carry out its review and will see what, what has happened and what, 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 is the, what is the result of, of the safeguards on, on steel markets. And then we will see. Um, uh, the safeguards were introduced uh, by the Commission because the Commission acknowledged that this was an, a proportionate measure to um, the introduction of Section 232 by the U.S., but also because the Commission acknowledged that there was, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, an imbalance between, let's say, the increase in capacity by some, let's say, uh, uh, other major steel producers worldwide uh, and the EU, whereas the capacity in the EU has not increased uh, significantly, as I've shown in my presentation, capacity. Um, I mean, we, production levels have rebounded sharply recently, but then have remained around low, low levels in historical terms. So the, 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 EU, the, the European Commission, I think, will take into account also this, this factor, uh, but it's very hard to say what, what, what they are going to decide. We will see, we will have a review, and uh, we, will, uh, we will wait and see what happens then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions from the audience. Uh, well, but apparently it was a very clear uh, presentation, uh, Alessandro. Everybody, uh, well, we have over 500 people uh, watching and listening, So, but there are no more questions. So <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, just a second, there, there's one question probably. Uh, yes. Uh, my colleague is just uh, going to let us have the question. It has been um, sent. If you don't mind. Uh, Fine, sure. A few more seconds. Uh, she's going to let me uh, read it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question is sent to us by uh, Ms. Zehra Karakula. And uh, let me read. We can see the October HRC, hydro coil, and raw material spread at... 673.74 euros per ton for November. Uh, for November, it has become 669.35 euros per ton. Uh, price for hydro coil is decreasing because of lack of demand, and while iron ore and coke prices are increasing more aggressively. 
Other important costs will be for green production revolution. My question is, what will be the effect of green production cost for European steel producers? Oh, thank you. No, very interesting question. I, I, I can answer to the second part, let's say, to the final question, because I I'm not comfortable in, in talking about um, forecast of steel prices and these kind of things. We have sure. some strict rules, you know, so, but um, no, in, uh, in relation to uh, the cost of the green revolution or of a green deal, let's say, uh, this is a very important commitment that the steel sector, the European steel sector has, uh, has made and we're very committed to um, carrying on the transition to, towards green deal. Which is a very ambitious and demanding target, uh, which is very costly. Obviously, everybody knows it requires a lot of investment. Uh, but there are, let's say, financial facilities and, and mechanisms uh, within the EU, agreed with the European Commission, which can support the um, the, uh, the the overall steel sector. Whereas it remains true that we we, we need a lot of investment. We need a lot of uh, it, it's a lot of money. Which is a stake, uh, and um, these days we have we have to cope with this uh, increase in, in raw material prices and the commodity prices, which uh, some most people believe it was a short-term increase. But as I shown in, in part, as I've said in my presentation, uh, it is most likely not a short-term increase. It is probably going to stay. So we need to cope with it on top of everything. So um, it. Uh, it is essential that we can use, for example, we can use a scrap at lower lower prices than, um, because uh, as an essential part of the transition is uh, the shift towards uh, EAF, towards ele electric furnace technology, which relies very much on scrap. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in Europe, still prevailing technology is based on, on blast furnace. Uh, albeit with different, with important differences uh, at individual country level. For example, in Italy, the prevailing technology is, is EAF. Uh, but anyway, um, we, we, the transition will be long and will be costly. And uh, we hope that the European institutions will support the steel sector in, in this transition um, in terms of uh, financial support and in terms of uh, yeah legal support. and. Um, we, we believe that it will be successful. But that, as I said, it's really a commitment which we, we made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, I believe uh, that's also, this concludes the uh, Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Alessandro. Uh, it was great to have you with us today. Uh, we have enjoyed and uh, benefited a lot. Uh, please take good care of yourself. Stay healthy and safe. Hope to see you soon in person. Uh, as I keep saying, grazie mille and ciao. You're welcome. So it was a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.